and determine what kind of rhythm we are looking at, we need to have some basic understanding of uh, what are the things we need to look for. Uh, so let us start off with the basic uh, uh, electrocardiographic uh, building block, which is the QRS complex, which is the PQRST complex, which is representing one heart. Here is the electrical system of the heart. Here at the junction of the superior vena cava and the right atrium, we have the sinus node, which originates the impulse. The impulse travels through the atrium that causes the, the deflection, which is, reflect, which is uh, represented by the P wave. Then it uh, traverses through the AB node, which causes this uh, PQ delay or the P or interval as it is called. After that, the impulse uh, traverses uh, through the Purkinje system and it uh, activates the ventricular uh, muscle that is reflected by the Q or S complex. After that, we have a, a stasis period and that is followed by ventricular repolarization, which is reflected by the T wave. So when we have a strip in front of us, first we need to determine the rate. The rate is determined by the time that is uh, between the RR spikes. The next item we need to look at is the RR intervals. Are the RR intervals regular? That suggests a regular rhythm. If the RR intervals from one cycle to the next cycle and to the next cycle are irregular, then we are dealing with an irregular heart rhythm. We need to look at the atrial activity. Do we see atrial activity? What kind of atrial activity do we see? Similarly, how does the QRS complex look? Does it look narrow? Does it look wide? Does it look uh, different? Then we go to the T waves and the ST segments. Of course, the T waves and the ST segments uh, reflect more in relationship to ischemia strain or infarction and we're going to look at some examples of those. Now here is a rhythm strip. Take a moment and see what this represents. Okay, as soon as you see a rhythm strip, these are the points we need to go through. Okay, what is the rate? The rate is determined by the RR interval and here are one second marks on the ECG paper. Let me see if I have another slide which talks about, okay, here is an example of how to determine the rate in an electrocardiogram rhythm strip. As I said, this represents one second and each one of them is divided into five major segments like this five major segments and then each five major segment is divided into five smaller segments. So the smallest segment represents uh, 0 0.04 second or 40 milliseconds. So this is equal to one second. If a heartbeat is occurring every second, then the heart rate is 60. However, if it is happening at a rate of 0.8 seconds, then the heart rate is 75. If it is happening at a rate of a 0.6, that is equal to 100. And this comes to 150. If the heart rate is, if one bit is happening here and the second one is happening here, then the heart rate is 150. So that's how you determine the heart rate. So let's go back to our first tracing here. This is a sinus rhythm. Here we have an atrial rate of rate of 75 and we have a regular rhythm. The RR intervals uh, are regular. We have a definite P wave which is uh, preceding each QRS complex. The QRS complexes are narrow, the S3 segment is normal, and the T waves are upright. So this is a normal sinus rhythm. The normal sinus rhythm, of course, does not need any treatment of uh, any sort. So let's move to the next one. We talked about how to determine the rate uh, based on the paper speed, which is uh, 25 millimeters per one second. Okay, here, what do we have? First of all, okay, we have P waves, all right? Then look at the PR intervals. The PR intervals are not constant. So that means we have varying PR intervals and there could be a dropped uh, P wave here and there's a long pause and a new cycle begins. So we have a ventricular rate which is variable and the rhythm is variable. We see P waves definitely and uh, the QRS complexes are narrow 
uh, the PR intervals vary. We have a progressive prolongation of the PR interval here. So the PR interval is short, it gets longer, it gets much longer and the P wave gets dropped, then a new cycle begins. So this is uh, known as Wenckebach. Wenckebach is uh, a type 1 type of uh, AV block which uh, rarely gives any problems. Most of the time it is uh, benign, we just need to watch. Uh, we may see this in patients with inferior myocardial infarction, but as long as we are taking care of uh, the ischemia and the uh, blood pressure, oxygen level and all this, uh, it should not be a major issue. Okay, let's look at here. And here we have a rate which is less than 60. So if you look at here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that will be, here it will be 60. Here this is like 55. So rate is definitely below 60. We also have a PR interval which is about 0 0.2 seconds which is at the upper limit of the normal. And we have of course what looks like a wide QRS complex. So this is an example of a bradycardia. And if this bradycardia is uh, associated with the symptoms of uh, sweating, or slight drop in blood pressure, the treatment would be atropine 0.5 milligrams intravenously and repeated uh, five minutes apart to a maximum of three milligrams. You can also use epinephrine if the patient is unstable or if the blood pressure is unstable. So this is an example of a significant bradycardia rhythm strip. Okay, we, here we have another example of a significantly slow heart rate. If you want to really measure it, this is one, two, three, four, five, that's one second, one, two, three, four. So that's like uh, almost happening like less than 30 per minute. So this is a situation where you can use atropine uh, for the immediate purpose. If the patient is really symptomatic, again, we can try atropine, but if those don't work, we may have to think of uh, putting in an external or a transvenous pacemaker. All right, now let's look at this one. Again, as I said, we need to look at the rate, the rhythm, the atrial activity, QRS complex, ST segment, and T waves in order to determine exactly what the rhythm represents. Here we have a rate which is like if we have three boxes, the three big boxes, that is 100, and this is 150, so this is between 100 and 150, it's close to 150, so I would say it would be close to like 135. It says 125, but it's close to like 135. There is minor variation in the rate, but nonetheless, we have a P wave preceding each QRS complex. We have normal SGT segments, the QRS are narrow. This is a, an example of a sinus tachycardia. The sinus tachycardia rate ranges from 100 to 160 beats per minute. Sinus tachycardia is not normal. Sinus tachycardia is usually due to some underlying causes such as fever, hypoxia, uh, dehydration, bleeding, heart failure, etc. So we need to identify the underlying causes and treat them. So sinus tachycardia is not something we can ignore. It is something that is telling us uh, we need to look further to determine what is causing the sinus uh, tachycardia and treat the underlying cause. Here is a, an example of a, a much r faster rate, which is almost like a 150 to 165 rate. And uh, this is an example of a supraventricular or paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. Could be like a atrial tachycardia. The rate is regular. There is a P wave which is uh, here and a narrow QRS complex. And the T wave and the P waves are sort of merged together because of the rapid uh, rate. The ST segments are okay and the T waves are all right. The treatment for uh, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia is adenosine 6 milligrams IV followed by a bolus and repeat the dose uh, in a few minutes uh, if necessary. If this rhythm is associated with uh, unstable uh, vital signs, then we may have to consider cardioversion. 
if that is indicated. If the rate is like 180 and if the patient is having shortness of breath, if the patient looks uh, pale, if the blood pressure is low, then definitely a cardioversion would be in order. Okay, here is an example of a narrow QRS. The rate is uh, 120 plus and the interesting thing is we have a QRS complex but we don't see a P wave preceding the QRS complex. On the contrary, we see a P wave which is following the QRS complex. So this is a P wave which is happening after the QRS complex. So we are dealing with a junctional tachycardia junctional tachycardia and the ST segments and the T waves are okay. So again, junctional tachycardia is usually related to some kind of an underlying heart disease like myocardial infarction. And we need to find, find the underlying causes and treat the underlying causes. We need to differentiate this from sinus tachycardia where we see regular preceding uh, P waves uh, uh, whereas uh, in junctional tachycardia, you see a P wave following the QRS complexes. Okay, here, what do we have? Here we got three beats, which looks fairly regular. Then here is a what looks like an atrial beat, but it's coming much earlier than the expected next beat, which should be somewhere here. So this is a premature atrial beat. This is a premature atrial beat because it resembles the sinus beat but the P wave is a little bit distorted compared to the sinus P waves and it is happening, it is occurring prior to the next sinus beat. Atrial premature beats are frequently seen in patients with uh, chronic lung disease or in patients with uh, chronic heart disease uh, and especially in an acute illness situation, premature atrial beats may be a precursor of uh, atrial flutter or fibrillation. So it is very important for us to keep uh, an eye on these uh, premature atrial beats and make sure that our electrolytes uh, such as uh, potassium, magnesium are normal and the hemoglobin is normal and the pH is normal so we minimize the chances for any of these uh, beats to progress to atrial flutter or fibrillation. Here is an example uh, which is uh, uh, like a normal beat and atrial premature beat. This is an atrial bigeminy rhythm which is a little more advanced. That's why I said we need to be observing these uh, irregular heartbeats because uh, they can progress to uh, more serious uh, types of rhythm problems uh, such as uh, atrial flutter or fibrillation. Huh, talking about uh, more serious atrial arrhythmias. So what is your diagnosis here? First of all, it uh, looks like a, the ventricular rate is around uh, 75 to 80 per minute. But look at the atrial waves. Electrical activity looks like sawtooth. This is called a sawtooth appearance, which is classic for atrial flutter. The atrial rate is approximately 300 beats per minute. And the QRS complexes are narrow. There is a four to one conduction of atrial beats. There's one, two, three, four, and the QRS con uh, conducted. So there is four to one conduction. The ST segments cannot be seen and the T waves cannot be actually seen in the presence of atrial flutter. What is the treatment? The treatment, if this is a paroxysmal atrial flutter, uh, we can try adenosine, uh, sometimes beta blockers uh, such as uh, low pressure, uh, may be used intravenously, slow the rate so it helps in diagnosing an underlying rhythm especially if it's uh, very rapid and if uh, the patient's condition is unstable we can do cardioversion using low dose uh, of uh, 25 to uh, it should be 50 watts uh, or joules. Again this rhythm uh, with treatment can go into atrial fibrillation or it can go into sinus rhythm. Uh, we also need to determine the underlying causes if the patient uh, has uh, some uh, electrical uh, accessory pathway that can be treated with ablation. Okay, this is uh, one of the most frequent arrhythmias we see in cardiology practice. Uh, 
here we have a narrow QRS complex. The RR intervals are varying from beat to beat. When you see RR intervals varying from beat to beat, the best way to find the heart rate would be to measure here's one second, two seconds, three, four, five, six seconds. And you take a six second strip and find out how many QRS complexes are there and you multiply that by 10. That will give you the heart rate per minute. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we have nine QRS complexes for six seconds duration. So the rate is 90 per minute. We do not see any discernible P waves. The QRS complexes are narrow. It's hard to determine the status of the SD and the T wave uh, segments. And this is a classic example of atrial fibrillation with uh, adequate ventricular response. If the rate was 130 or 140 or 180, then we would say atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. When a patient presents with atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response in the emergency room, first we need to get the rate down, then we need to work on the rhythm. So third, we need to work on the underlying causes such as heart failure or chronic lung disease. Later on, we need to determine about anticoagulation and of course the quality of life. So there are many things that need to be taken into consideration, but in an acute situation like doing a cardiac resuscitation, the most important thing is to reduce the rate and see if we can convert this to sinus rhythm if that is possible. So we can start off with drugs that reduce the rate in an acute situation and the most commonly used drugs are of course diltazem, uh, 10 to 15 milligram bolus followed by a drip. We can also give a beta blocker such as low pressure intravenously. In an acute situation, digoxin also works fairly well. You give 0 0.5 milligrams bolus followed by 0 0.25 milligrams every six hours for a total of one milligram to load the system with the digoxin. Uh, we can use verapamil by mouth for chronic management of uh, the atrial fibrillation with uh, rapid ventricular response. Uh, and of course, in an acute situation, we would definitely check electrolytes uh, such as potassium and magnesium and correct those electrolytes uh, to minimize uh, the effect of arrhythmias on the target organs. Here we have a, a 12 hit electrocardiogram. Of course, the rate is approximately 75 to 80 per minute. Okay, the most obvious thing in this particular electrocardiogram is uh, an RSR prime which is representative of a right bundle branch block. Right bundle branch block is commonly seen in patients with chronic lung disease, in patients with myocardial infarction or with right ventricular pressure overload such as pulmonary hypertension of any type and generally there is no treatment needed for right bundle branch block uh, as such. Okay, here is an example of uh, tall R waves in, in the lateral leads with deep S waves in the anterior leads associated with the ST depression and T wave inversion. This is an example of a left ventricular hypertrophy. Also there is a, a, a deflection of the atrial component, left atrial component of the P wave uh, which is seen in V1. If it involves more than one small box, it is suggestive of a left atrial enlargement. So here we have a classic example of a left ventricular hypertrophy with the strain. Here we see some ST elevation, but that is a normal variation we see in patients with the left ventricular hypertrophy, and it doesn't necessarily suggest uh, uh, any evidence of an acute myocardial infarction. Here is an example where we have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, heart rate of 60, and uh, the PR interval is almost uh, like two major block bo box that is equal to almost, uh, this is uh, point, this is point 0.2 and this is point 0.4, this is point 0.6 and point 0.8 and 1 uh, second, so this is almost point. Uh, uh, 4 or 0 0.38 uh, or 380 milliseconds. So we are looking at a first degree AV block. Generally first degree AV block doesn't really signify anything significant that we can manage. We just need to observe this uh, and make sure that this, doesn't, this does not progress to uh, like second degree AV block something like that. Here we 
have a sinus rhythm because this a preceding P wave with each QRS complex, narrow QRS complex, STT segments are normal. The rate is approximately like 80 per minute. And here we see some wide QRS complex. This is an example of a premature ventricular beat. Whenever we see premature ventricular beats, we, we need to be concerned about it, especially in the presence of a myocardial infarction or hypoxia or hypovolemia because they may suggest uh, ischemia and may also progress to more serious arrhythmia such as uh, bigeminy, trigeminy or even VTAC. And when we see that, we really need to determine the underlying uh, medical uh, underlying conditions and check potassium, magnesium, oxygen levels, hemoglobin. And if there anything that needs to be fixed, we can fix those. If they are happening more frequently, of course, you know, it can be treated with uh, most commonly used drug is, of course, amiodarone 200 to 400 milligrams a day, given in divided doses. Okay, here we have an example of a Mobitz type 2 AB block. And here we have a, a normal QRS complex and a P wave with a dropped QRS complex. It is hard to say whether this is a, like a Wenke block or whether it's a type 2 Mobitz uh, block, but uh, Nonetheless, the underlying causes such as ischemia, infarction or hypoxia, hypovolemia need to be addressed. Okay, here is an interesting uh, example. Uh, here we see P waves. Here's another P wave. Here's a 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 P wave. A P wave. The rate is very slow. We have a ventricular type of complex with the wide QRS uh, uh, complex. The P waves have no relationship to the QRS complexes. So this is an example of a complete heart block and this is a more serious rhythm problem uh, which needs to be treated with uh, external or transcutaneous pacemaker and eventually if this is a chronic condition the patient needs a permanent pacemaker. In an acute situation we could use a isopril drip to increase the heart rate but uh, the best thing would be to get an external pacemaker or a transvenous pacemaker uh, so that we can stabilize the patient's condition uh, as quickly as possible. Here is another example of a complete heart block because the P waves have no relationship to the QRS complexes. The QRS complexes are of course narrowed so they could be arising from the AV junctional site. Uh, again, they have the same significance as uh, the patients with the uh, QRS complexes arising from the ventricular uh, site, they need to be treated pretty aggressively. This is another example where we have the P waves which have no relationship and a very wide QRS complex suggesting fairly sick ventricle. So we need to take a more aggressive step in establishing a stable rhythm in this patient which means uh, uh, external pacemaker or a permanent pacemaker so that we can establish a rhythm. Since there is some good atrial activity, we may be able to put a AB sequential pacemaker to optimize cardiac output. All right, now we are moving into what looks like a wide QRS uh, tachycardia. So if you look at the peaks here, there are approximately two big boxes. Uh, that is like 150, 160 to 170 per minute. And the QRS complexes are wide. We don't see any P waves. The T waves seem to be okay. It's hard to say since we are looking at a rhythm strip. And this is uh, an example of a ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia could be stable or unstable and they can be chronic or intermittent. Depending on the situation, the treatment may vary a little bit. If the patient is stable and if the blood pressure is normal, then we may be able to just treat them with uh, intravenous uh, amiodarone, 150 milligrams uh, bolus uh, over 10 minutes, followed by a drip, and then start on oral amiodarone. However, if the patient is in an ischemic state uh, following a myocardial infarction, something like that, uh, then we need a more aggressive approach where we would administer amiodarone 300 milligrams IV and start uh, a drip uh, at one milligram per minute. If the patient is really unstable, we could even use epinephrine 
or a lidocaine and definitely we'll check the electrolytes and correct the potassium and magnesium levels. Here's another example of a, a ventricular tachycardia which is much faster here almost 180 to 190 uh, beats per minute and uh, again the treatment would be more in terms of unstable ventricular tachycardia because of a much faster rate and much more distorted QRS complex. Uh, okay, this is an example of uh, uh, what is uh, commonly known as the torso de point uh, because uh, the axis of the QRS complex is uh, changing during the course of uh, this rhythm strip and this is a highly unstable rhythm because it can very quickly degenerate into ventricular fibrillation and hence this needs to be very aggressively treated with epinephrine, amiodarone, lidocaine, magnesium and if necessary even uh, uh, defibrillation uh, if the patient's condition is unstable. More than likely a patient in this rhythm would be unstable who would be hypoxic and the approach would be to stabilize medically and then treat with uh, uh, defibrillation. Here's an example of a fine ventricular fibrillation where the undulations are very very uh, narrow and also very the amplitudes are small. This is suggestive of uh, almost uh, like a terminal rhythm uh, or this is something we see uh, following an acute myocardial infarction that this has to be very aggressively treated uh, with epinephrine, amiodarone, defibrillation. Here is another example of a fine ventricular fibrillation with a little more uh, visible uh, uh, QRS complexes but nonetheless the prognosis in these patients uh, is uh, very poor and immediate treatment is uh, of the essence in establishing stable cardiac rhythm. This is uh, what we call as agonal ventricular rhythm. Uh, we see an occasional ventricular beat here and there but, but for practical purposes we more or less have a, a flat line and this we see in, in the final stages of uh, uh, prolonged CPR the prognosis is very poor. The treatment would be similar to that of a patient with asystole. Talking about asystole, here's an example of a asystole. There's no evidence of any QRS complex. There's no evidence of atrial activity. We're just seeing some wiggly waves uh, and there's practically no electrical activity in the heart uh, and this has to be treated with epinephrine and this has to be treated with epinephrine. Here's another example of a, what is like a flat line. We can treat with epinephrine. If there's no response, we, I would say maybe we have reached the end of a, an unsuccessful uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Now, this is an example of a left ventricular hypertrophy with the strain and uh, which we already saw previously. So let's move on to the next one. And here's an example of a, a white QRS complex and the PR interval is almost non-existent. Here we have the P waves and immediately there is a, what we call the delta wave and then the QRS uh, becomes uh, uh, apparent. So this is an example of a WPW and patients with the WPW have accessory pathways. Patients uh, who have WPW are more prone for uh, tachyarrhythmias. Uh, these tachyarrhythmias are tricky because uh, the only drugs that you would really want to use in these arrhythmias to block the accessory pathway would be beta blockers, amiodarone or procainamide. Using any other drugs such as lidocaine may make these arrhythmias worse. That's one thing to keep in mind. So when you see a patient with WPW with the rapid ventricular response, then always consider beta blockers or even procainamide. This is an example of an acute inferior and lateral wall myocardial infarction. Here we have a regular sinus rhythm, narrow QRS complexes, but we have significant ST elevation. This is the ST elevation in 2, 3, AVF, V5 and V6. So this is uh, representing the infralateral region. So this is an example of an acute uh, myocardial infarction. And of course, uh, this is an emergency. These patients uh, can be either taken to the cardiac catheterization lab for acute coronary intervention, uh, but nonetheless, the treatment uh, from the emergency room would include oxygen, aspirin, nitroglycerin, morphine, fibrinolytics, urgent PCI, and uh, 
long term beta blocker. Okay, here is an example of an anterior myocardial infarction where there is ST elevation in V2, V3, V4, V5. So, along with the right bundle branch block, left atrial enlargement. So, the treatment for this would also be very similar to the one we saw in the previous slide. So, this is a case of an acute uh, extensive anterior myocardial infarction with right bundle branch block which carries a more serious prognosis compared to patients with uh, just anterior myocardial infarction without right bundle branch block. This is an example of a AB sequential pacemaker because we see a spike here followed by a P wave and then we see a second spike which is followed by a wide QRS complex. So, this is a, a classical, this is a classic example of uh, a AB sequential pacemaker which seems to be working properly. During the early course of this presentation, we saw cases of right bundle branch block and even two slides before we saw a case of a right bundle branch block in the presence of an anterior myocardial infarction. This is an example of a left bundle branch block and here we have a wide QRS complex in one AVL and in the lateral chest leads associated with deep wide S waves in the anterior leads. So, this is an example of a left bundle branch block and finally, we have one more item that we need to cover and that is these negative T waves which are known as giant negative T waves. These are suggestive of left ventricular ischemia. They may also be seen in patients with cerebrovascular accidents and this is something we have to treat like an acute coronary syndrome and take appropriate steps to diagnose the extent of the underlying coronary artery disease or cerebrovascular problems. Again, this is an example of the left bundle branch block which we just saw a few minutes ago. Here is an example of uh, a sinus bradycardia and associated with that there is a long pause here after almost regular cycle for three beats and when we see something like this we need to be worried about a blocked PAC which is not maybe buried in the T wave or it could be a sinus arrhythmia. Since these T waves are similar, these T waves, uh, this T wave looks a little bit different from the other T waves. You may assume this could be a blocked PAC. If all the T waves were identical, then you would worry about sinus arrhythmia, but the, P, the RR interval is too long for sinus arrhythmia to be represented in this rhythm step. So, that's how we, we come up with a diagnosis by a process of elimination. Okay, to summarize, ladies and gentlemen, when you're looking at a rhythm strip for an ACLS test, uh, first you need to look at the RR intervals, make sure what the rate is, then you look at the rhythm by measuring, by looking at the RR intervals uh, in the whole rhythm strip, uh, look for the atrial activity and determine what type of atrial activity you are seeing. Look at the QRS complex and see whether it is supraventricular or ventricular. Then you look at the STT segments to determine any evidence of uh, ischemia, strain, infarction or uh, ventricular ischemia and then you come up with a most plausible diagnosis.